Well, good afternoon. I'm Liana Sueja, the program director at AgStart, coming to you from beautiful Woodland, California. We're delighted that you could join us today for the National Ag Tech Forum on Agricultural Biologicals. Well, first, I would like to um, tell you a little bit about AgStart, and then we'll have a quick intro to Ag Biologicals. I'll then introduce our guests. Our two entrepreneurs will present, and then we will move into Q&A with our special guest, Dr. Pamela Marone. Before we launch in, I'd like to tell you about the next National Ag Tech Forum, which will be on May 19th, and the topic will be the future of carbon markets and resulting ag technologies. Please check out the site below at ncbiotech.org for more information and registration. Registration will open next week. So first, a little bit about AgStart. AgStart is a startup incubator with a mission to accelerate ag food and health innovation in our Western region. We provide startups with education, mentoring, and connections to collaborators, customers, and investors. AgStart will soon open a brand new shared use incubator in Woodland for innovators and startups in ag, food, and health. The lab at AgStart will be the only combination shared use wet lab and food lab in the whole state. If you or anyone you know is looking for lab space or a landing spot in our Western region, please contact us. We'd love to hear from you. So a short intro into agricultural biologicals. First, what are we talking about? Well, in the US, they generally fall into three categories. First, biopesticides. Well, the US EPA defines biopesticides as pesticides derived from natural materials. They fall into two subcategories. First, biochemical pesticides, which contain naturally occurring substances that control pests. One good example would be pyrethrins. Second, microbial pesticides. They contain microorganisms that function as biocontrol agents. A good example would be Bt. Second, on biostimulants. Well, there's no specific legal or even standard definition for biostimulant in the US, but the Biological Products Industry Association has been advocating the following standard definition substances and or microorganisms that stimulate natural plant processes for nutrient uptake, nutrient efficiency, quality or stress tolerance. Similarly, there is no specific legal definition or standard definition for biofertilizers in the US. But here too, the Biological Products Industry Alliance is working hard to get a national standard in place. In the US, biofertilizers generally include any natural substances. And the key difference between biofertilizers and biostimulants is that biofertilizers provide plant nutrition, i.e. NPK or micronutrients. Well, the ag biologicals market is growing at a really rapid rate. This chart from 2018 shows one contributing factor. The rate of introduction of biological products is increasing and outpacing conventionals. From an average of three new global market introductions prior to 1990 to an average of 11 between 1990 and 2016. And this trend is only expected to continue. So why this trend? Well, there are many, many factors and I'm sure we'll get into these with our guests, but one key factor is that biologicals fill an increasing demand for crop protection products that are effective and safer for both people and the environment. Well, the total market value for biologicals has been growing at an increasing rate. This table from 2018 shows the growth of the biopesticides market. Similar studies have shown that a greater than 15% compound and growth rate for biopesticides over the decade 2010 to 2020. And looking at the global market for biologicals overall, recent data has valued it at over $5 billion in 2020, more than doubling in just six years. 
Well, now it is my great pleasure to introduce two California-based entrepreneurs in the ag biologicals space. Dr. Fatma Kaplan is the CEO, CSO of Farinim. She has a PhD in plant molecular and cellular biology and postdoctoral training in natural product chemistry. Dr. Kaplan discovered the first nematode sex pheromone and published her findings in Nature in 2008. She discovered that pheromones regulate behaviors in both parasitic and beneficial nematodes. And she also conducted the first agricultural biocontrol experiment in space on the ISS in 2020. She's worked as a scientist at NASA, the National Magnetic Field Lab, and the USDA ARS. Dr. Kaplan founded Pheronome to bring nematode pheromone technology to the marketplace. Gaston Salinas is the CEO of Botanical Solution Inc., or BSI. He is an industrial engineer who has built his professional career around science-based ventures and corporate innovation. 10 years of professional consulting experience have allowed him, allowed him to translate promising university research into an international business with growing revenues and a solid value proposition for multi-billion dollar industries. And it is a distinct pleasure to introduce ag biologicals expert and industry pioneer, Dr. Pamela Marone. Pam has more than a 30 year career focused on leading the way to a more sustainable agriculture through discovery and commercialization of biological products for pest management and plant health. She is currently executive chair of primary bioag innovations and global bioag linkages. These companies help innovators scale and succeed in market adoption. In 2006, Pam founded Marone Bioinnovations, which became listed on NASDAQ in 2013. Pam recently received the Most Admired CEO Distinguished a Career Award from the Sacramento Business Journal. Pam retired in 2020 as MBI CEO and continues to serve on the board and as an advisor. Before Marone Bio, she started and led the bioprotection company, AgriQuest. So Fatma, if you're ready to present, we are ready to listen. Hi, Liana. Thank you for this very kind introduction. Now I will share my screen. Uh, once uh, your screen share is uh, move away, I can um, share my screen. So, um, hi everyone. I am Fatma Kaplan, CEO and founder of Fernim. We use pheromones to control agricultural pests. Okay. Um. Okay. <laughs> Um, crop losses to agricultural pests represent significant losses for growers and the global agriculture sector, resulting in growers spending substantial amount annually on pest control. Currently, the agricultural pest control market is $60 billion. Just for insect control, farmers spend globally $16 billion. Concerns with the tox toxicity and environmental impact of traditional chemicals, chemical controls have resulted in deregulation and outright bans on specific traditional chemical controls, leaving a significant gaps that demand eco-friendly alternatives. Biocontrols 
represents uh, the fastest growing segment of the overall agricultural pest, pest control industry with 3.5 billion annually. But significant gaps remain for specific controls, such as control of soil pests, including plant parasitic nematodes, and as well as other organisms. Beneficial nematodes represent a potential control for soil-based pests, but have suffered from limited effectiveness. Ferronim's unique product, Nimestim, a pheromone-based approach offers significant improvements in nematode, nematode effectiveness. Ferricode here is another application of Ferronim's pheromone-based approach to protect seeds and newly transplanted crops from parasitic nematodes. Our next step is on the direct path to commercialization. Now I'm going to tell you our business and technical progress and goals for Nimestim. Since Nimestim will be sold to beneficial uh, will be sold with beneficial nematodes, we identified the key players in the market. Nematode manufacturers like Coppert, Enema, BASF, and Bioline Agrosciences, uh, which directly sell to growers or sell through the ag retailers, such as Arbico Organics or Wilbur Ellis. These producers right here also act as toll manufacturers for and other nematode providers like Bioneema. So we have developed relationships with key players in the market like Coppert, Enema, BASF, Bioline Agrosciences for potential manufacturing or acting as toll producers for Nemistim, partnership for sales and market entry. Currently, Fernim is the only company that has a patent on the nematode pheromones. Our pheromone products offer pest control in the soil compared to our competitors' product that target insect pests in the air. Additionally, our product can enhance other biopesticide companies' products and make them potential partners. Furthermore, our pheromone product offers a unique seed treatment application. Currently, pheromones um, are among the most sought after eco-friendly solutions. Our team has the talent and the relationships to succeed and bring Nemestim and Ferrico to the market. My co-founder, Carl, and I are domain experts, and I have more than 10 years of experience in pheromones and nematodes. I identified the first sex pheromone in a model nematode and published in Nature. Then USDA recruited me to apply pheromone technology to agriculturally important nematodes. There, I found that nematodes control other behaviors, including dispersal behavior, which is the basis for nematodes and ferricode. And our product development from bench to field is guided by our customers' need. We have interviewed 164 ag professionals, including 77 growers at the NSF iCorps program. During our interviews, organic growers told us that they have limited tools. They can't use systemic pesticides because these pesticides go inside the plant and they can go throughout the plant when the insect feeds on them, they directly receive, but they're not allowed to use that. When they use contact pesticides, insects hide under the leaves above ground, or they go deeper in the soil to avoid contact pesticides. To top it off, pesticides have limited penetrance in the soil. 
and beneficial organisms have a limited temperature range. To our surprise, conventional growers were also interested in beneficial organism friendly products. They were participating in IPM programs and did not want to use harsh chemicals. They were looking for pest control solutions friendly to beneficial organisms. Our first product, Nemestem, directly addresses farmers' need for insect pest control. It is an additive to beneficial nematodes to control insect pests in the soil. Currently, farmers receive commercial nematodes in a small package and they dehydrate them. Right at this stage, we add Nemestem in their first step. And when they're rehydrated, we also activate them to search and look for an insect pest. The activated nematodes are placed in large containers for field applications to control insect pests. Now, pheromone treated beneficial nematodes travel down in the soil over a foot, going after deep dug pests that conventional pesticides can't reach. In this soil trial, and it is uh, demonstrated by a third party, the pheromone treated nematodes go down 35 centimeter deep in the soil three times more and infect the insect. This directly addresses organic farmers' needs and provides an alternative to systemic pesticides. Even if the insects go deeper in the soil, they will not avoid the infection because nematodes will chase them down. Nemestem increases beneficial nematodes effectiveness up to 78% for pecan weevil in greenhouse trials. And this has been demonstrated by two independent laboratories with two different nematode species, con uh, commercial species. We at Farnum showed that we can expand beneficial nematodes effective temperature range down to 15 Celsius. Normally they're effective at 25 Celsius. This also directly addresses farmer's need. We cannot control the temperature in the field, but we can make biologicals work at high and low temperature better. So we improve efficacy with two modes of action. By improving nematode dispersal, without pheromones, nematodes stay put. When they're treated with pheromones, they start searching. Here they are staying in one location. We added the pheromones they started looking for. So pheromones in this case tells the nematodes they're out of food, they need to find a new host. Pheromones also makes them more infectious. The pheromone treated nematodes here uh, are three times more infectious against citrus weevil. And this has been tested with two different commercial, uh, commercially available nematode species. Now this slide summarizes our progress on our product development, which is guided by growers needs. We have leveraged grants with incubators, accelerators, and mentorship programs to validate our technology. Currently, we are raising funds to scale up our manufacturing. We have a path to scalable manufacturing. We are moving from insect nematode system for producing pheromones to an insect-free system in shaker flask we have funding for this from NSF SBIR phase one grant. Next year, we will move from shaker flask to fermenters and we will scale up stepwise. In parallel, we will develop an industrial scale pheromone extraction system. Thank you. Thank you, Fatma, for a very super informative presentation. Gaston, we're eager to hear from you.
Thank you, Fatma. We're uh, very excited to hear next from Gaston. All right. Uh, thank you again for, for the invitation of, for being part of, of this uh, great event um, today. So um, as it was mentioned, my, my name is Gaston Salinas, co-founder and CEO at Botanical Solution, a company that started operations back in 2013 in, in Santiago, Chile. And since 2019, we re relocated our headquarters to, to the US. And I've been living in Northern California since then um, as well. So today, I would like to walk you through our journey as a company, starting with our proprietary technology to deal with common issues associated with traditional botanicals in terms of quality and supply of those key traditional raw materials. Just as uh, a general understanding, the total traditional botanical markets is estimated to reach around $18 billion by the end of the year 2025, when we look into all applications of botanicals for different industry and market segments. Our first advanced botanical material called ABM01 fuels our first product, Botrystop, which is a biofungicide that is in the marketplace since 2019 in a close partnership with Syngenta. Botrystop is based on a plant, a plant material from, uh, or that is native to, to Chile in, in, in South America. And more recently, we announced that Botrystop, we will be expanding its footprint throughout uh, Latin America, also with Syngenta for Peru and for Mexico by late 2022 uh, for, for the Mexican market uh, uh, particularly. Although we understand that as a company, we have a talent to transition from a single product company to a portfolio company. And we have set ambitious goals to launch four new products based on our proprietary technology platform between the year 2023 and the year 2026. Basically, our strategy is based on our own efforts of sourcing different plant materials available in the continental territory of Chile, including the only two known species of the Antarctic territory. But also, we have paid close attention to, I would say, already successful um, um, active ingredients in the marketplace that are expected to be in short supply. So. Before moving on, I would like to share with you a short video just to illustrate how the Quillaja Saponaria plant material has been over has been under over exploitation over decades in Chile. In Chile, Quillaja tree. Let me see if I'm, I just want to double check. There you go. Is grow in an area about 800,000 acres in size. That's really quite huge. And you've got on average about four and a half tons of Kilaya per acre in this overall area. Now, CONAF, the Forestry Management Group of Chile, allows us to harvest or allows anybody to harvest up to 35% of the total biomass in a five year period. I believe that we would all agree that does, it doesn't make any sense to harvest a full acre of a native plant from Chile to protect, to protect uh, an, an, an acre of, let's say, table grapes, blueberries, or any other high value crop. But putting aside for a minute, the potential environment, the negative environmental footprint uh, for this sort of broken paradigm, I would also like to focus on the quality of materials coming from natural sources, the consistency of the chemical composition of those materials, 
uh, and eventually the limited supply of those uh, uh, botanical derived raw materials. We've been observing over a long period of time, no matter the industry that you look at, if you have a product that is based on natural sources of, of botanicals, in the end, you will hit some limitations in terms of supply of those materials. And then when you look to all those bottlenecks combined, then you have additional issues on the side of development of novel active ingredients. For example, the variability of those active ingredients, cost of goods, and in the end, limited production. Now, I would like to invite you to a virtual tour to our own lab in, in Santiago, Chile, which is pretty different to a forest. Here, we grow little plants uh, that in average have 30 to 60 days old that are inoculated into bioreactors to make them grow really quickly. But at the same time, we're using those little plants to generate pretty specific uh, biochemical profiles that we have discovered that have unique biological activity for, for different uh, biocidal purposes. The other key takeaway on how we do things is that no matter if you compare one gram, one kilogram, or maybe a ton of our fresh biomass or dry biomass, the chemical composition of those materials is almost identical. So we have built on three main strong foundations the future of the company, starting with the quality of those materials in terms of consistency. Then we have put together a fully vertically integrated manufacturing system to control all the elements related to the way how we grow those plant materials. So we can virtually supply unlimited uh, quantities of those active ingredients. And in the end, since we are also generating unique chemical compositions or unique chemistry out of those plant materials, we've been able to capture the value generated under our IP strategy in the company. All what we do internally at the lab in terms of our plant growth platform is covered today by trade secrets, but all the products coming out of, the, of our platform, we've been able and successful to file invention patents for those final products. So how does our technology and product market uh, fit into this global opportunity for ag following the global market trends in terms of food security, food safety, and sustainability with a growing population towards the year 2050 of 9 billion people in the planet. So of course, there is a strong pressure on crop protection. It was mentioned by Leanna at the beginning of the, of the presentation as well. So we believe that our exciting news on the side of biopesticides uh, where they are outpacing by a huge margin the growth compared to traditional chemistry. So our first product, Botrystop, as I mentioned before, it is already uh, available in the marketplace uh, with Syngenta since 2019 in, in Chile. It's a Quillaja Sabonaria plant extract that has been mostly focused on botrytis in specialty crops. Our understanding of the mode of action is that it's a powerful enzyme inhibitor uh, and, 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 and affects directly the, the pathogen. And on the side of the, the crops treated with the, with the product, it triggers the SAR effect. Uh, we, we are expecting to roll out the product during late 2021 uh, this year in Peru, and we have high, high expectations to launch the product by late 2022 um, in, in Mexico. We're making an important progress into the regulatory path here in the US. We have already submitted our product registration dossier to uh, EPA and to California DPR. And we will be putting a lot of effort in expanding our testing program in different geographies around, around the globe. So let me deep dive for a minute into what has been our experience to date into the Chilean market and tell you more details about the product adoption, not basically on the organic market, but I would say mostly concentrated on the side of conventional agriculture. Uh, the product to date has been approved for several high value crops, but we have seen most adoption, of course, on, on grapes and blueberries. You can see that um, basically there is an important growth year after year and quarter after after quarter regarding the, 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 the season and the crop that is the, the, that has been used the, the, the product. And to date, we're proudly uh, to announce that to date, we, we, we have been able to cover over 40,000 acres with, with our product and protect and give additional um, 
uh, coverage to those growers that are exporting uh, their, their fresh produce to different markets around the globe. Even though the product has a strong recommendation from bloom to pre-harvest on both uh, high value crops, the, the, the sweetest spot has been, has been concentrated on pre-harvest or near harvest uh, applications. Yet to give you, uh, an, I would say, a rough idea of the market potential in Chile, uh, it's around $12 million. Uh, and we've been growing our market share through the last three years. And, and now we, we have around 7% of market share with Pottery Stop, and we have higher expectations for, uh, for this year uh, as well. Now, moving back in time to 2014, and this is data that we generated with UC Davis, uh, with Douglas Gubler at the time. Uh, it gave us some confirmation at the time that we were developing our product that we had with the, our product use the standalone and interesting biological activity to prevent and control botrytis when we compare botrytis stop to other biological standards as part of integrated pest management strategies. Which was more surprising on our, on our side is that it was not only interesting for botrytis, but also it has an interesting biological activity against powdery mildew. Even though there, was, that there weren't much differences when you look into the incidence of powdery mildew on, on vine grapes, there were a significant effect on reducing the severity of powdery mildew, at least on our higher dose uh, of the product uh, back then. More recently, we, we have been conducting uh, or we have kept on exploring the broader spectrum of control of our product. And we have found out that, that it has also offered some interesting biological activity against Alternaria, Golovinomyces, Didymela in melon. And also we've seen some interesting biological activity in Corinespora, in cucumber, and also Levelula and Alternaria in tomatoes. So when we look at all the data that we have generated combined, uh, looking at bioassays, field trials, so, and so on, uh, we've seen there is a bright potential for the product to look into key target diseases with a high economical impact. But as I said before at the beginning of my presentation, we have this big ambition of transitioning from a single product company to a portfolio company. And we're expecting to launch four more products between the year 2023 and the year 2026. And now we have pretty interesting candidates, uh, as I said before, for starting with a new nematicide that, that we're expecting to launch uh, by early 2023. And we have a couple of herbicides and fungicides that are also down in our uh, pipeline. Regarding to our team, uh, our boards of directors uh, have a strong background in, in ag and also in the bio biopesticides industry. And as a team, we've been working together for almost eight years now, moving forward uh, early stage technology into the marketplace. We've been able to close commercial agreements with large corporations like Syngenta, now we're managing operations in four countries, and to date we've been able to secure up almost $4 million in venture, venture capital. We're also really grateful of all the support that we have received from UC Davis, uh, basically to make our landing softer in this, in this region. Uh, most of our traction has been covered for several, um, uh, I would say, um, ag specialized publications. Um, and just to wrap up and, and fire up the discussion with Pam, I would like to just leave this last slide just covering that on one hand, Bottery Stop has a clear market expansion underway, but we're working hard to expand all our pipeline potential. And of course, the strong foundation comes from our technology platform and the way how we're planning to uh, change what we believe it's a broken paradigm of exploitation of natural resources. Thank you so much for, for this opportunity. Okay. I never miss an opportunity to educate. So before I ask questions of our wonderful innovative entrepreneurs, I'm going to comment on something that Liana said. She said that pyrethrins were an example of a biochemical biopesticide, but actually pyrethrins, although they are natural, are actually registered as chemical pesticides because they have a toxic mode of action to the pest. 
So the safest category of natural products is actually biopesticides because they have to have a non-toxic mode of action to the pest if they're a biochemical. An example might be a pheromone for mating disruption of moths, um, fatty acids that disrupt the insect's cuticle, or uh, knotweed extract that boosts the plant's immune system. So again, never miss that opportunity to educate. The EPA does have the best system in the world. It's the most efficient for getting products through um, in, in a defined time frame. That was because of our Congress. Uh, they do something right. Back in 2001, passed the Pesticide Registration Improvement Act, which has been reauthorized several times to give us a very efficient system. Europe has the worst. Um, despite the fact that they have eliminated hundreds of chemicals and have all kinds of green initiatives and organic farming to be X percent by, you know, 2020 something, um, they, they still have a very cumbersome, difficult chemical-like process for biologicals. It's improving, but it's still very difficult and takes five, seven years or more. So why are biologicals growing so fast? Well, number one, they offer farmers a return on investment and a higher yield and quality that when integrated into programs. Number two, you can spray right up to harvest and not worry about chemical residues. Number three, you can spray in the morning and be back in the field in the afternoon because of the short uh, pre-harvest intervals. Um, you don't have to worry about pest developing resistance for the most part because they're complex modes of action. And, because, and the emphasis now on soil health and reducing agricultural's carbon footprint Bio, biologicals can, re, can improve soil health and reduce carbon footprint. There's a lot of data being generated and you're gonna hear a lot more about that. So, um, but, but what are the challenges that we still have? Why, why are bio, bio, biopesticides only 3 billion of 60 billion chemical pesticides? Well, in a Farm Journal Ag Web Pulse poll just recently, where they uh, surveyed 672 U.S. growers on their opinion of biologicals on the farm, 41% said, I need to know more before using. 21% said, I don't know. I don't know about them. Okay, that's 62%. That's the majority of the farmers. So only 35% said, I see potential, but only 4% said, had a negative perception. So we have, as an industry, a lot to do to further education, the education curve of and make farmers a lot more aware of these products and how to use them. So um, now I'm gonna talk to our wonderful, unique entrepreneurs with, with innovative technology. And this is a very crowded area. There's a lot of new startups. There's a, it's fantastic that there's a lot of money coming in and a lot of startups, a lot of venture capital and so forth. But uh, what's really key is you have to have unique differentiated technology. And it's really great to see these two entrepreneurs that have that. Um, and so you both moved from far away, Fatma from Florida and Gaston from, uh, from Chile. I'll start with Gaston. Why, why did you pick uh, Davis to locate yourself? Well, uh, I think there are many inspiring examples in Davis, particularly in the, in the biologicals and biopesticide space that when you're started your own business uh, from far and other geographies, uh, it's only inspiration. But of course, it's not only, it's only that part of the, of the story. Uh, as you said before, I come from, from Chile, which has, is a country that has a lot of similarities in terms of weather and high value crops that are grown here in, 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 in California. So Chile for us was a great pilot market uh, with growers or working uh, hand, uh, hand by hand with growers that were, I would say, pretty, pretty ahead of the pack in terms of awareness of residue management, pest resistance, efficacy for those that are not quite familiar with Chile is one of the leading exporting countries for fresh produce. So we learned a lot of their, their uh, experiences, their problems and their challenges. And, and, and I moved to California, of course, but because as any other entrepreneur and other a startup company a struggle with raising capital and until it was kind of a bubble that uh, provided many opportunities on the side of learning a lot from the growers but offered real, really little in terms of access to 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 capital so i always tell this story that when when i typically present to investors in chile they they tend to praise uh, my achievements but no one or really few were willing to write uh, a check and, and to help us to keep moving forward so of course, here in California, 
Uh, you have UC California Davis, particularly where I'm based uh, right now, which has a strong and, and, and great ecosystem to foster uh, entrepreneurial activities. And there's huge uh, amount of access to investors and to talent and to experience. So yeah, really enjoying my time here in California. And, and, and I think it's going to help me to move to the next step with, with my company. Great. Thank you. And Fatma, why did you go all across the way from Florida to Davis? Well, I have somewhat similar experience with fundraising. Actually, it was the funds that got me to San Francisco first in the Bio Accelerator. And that was actually our first investor. And the requirement was we were supposed to be in San Francisco for four and a half months during Accelerator. We thought about it and we thought, okay, uh, we'll move for four and a half months. But once we got to California, the entrepreneurial ecosystem was very different. It's so mature. It's like everywhere you turn, you can actually find help. It could be an introduction. It could be a funding source. And it's basically um, majority of the funding was around San Francisco. And we thought if you can't find, uh, find funding here, where else can we find? So the second thing was uh, the decision we decided to stay here is UC Davis. And why not we didn't stay in San Francisco versus Davis? We moved to Davis because I met Pam in one of the um, mentorship programs. And she mentored us in California Life Science Association Fellows of All Star Team Mentorship Program, and we really wanted Pam to be our, our advisor. <laughs> Pam did not know this one, but I was going to say I should mention. So we moved here, and we wanted to have Pam as our advisor and UC Davis. And one other really important thing is the uh, HM Klaus uh, Incubator, which really allowed us to have one leg in California. It was affordable compared to many other um, places. And that is how we got to stay. And it has been, let's see, since 2017, we never looked back. And even when we looked back, did we make the right decision to come to California and stay? And every time we evaluated and we thought this was the right decision. Thank you, Fatma. Boy, we are, we are very happy to have such a top university, agriculture university here with UC Davis. Always have to give a shout out. And and yes, HM Class, one of the early incubators. Um, and so happy that Ag Start is. I got to see a tour of the Ag Start in, in, in construction. And it's so the incubators will be fantastic. So that'll be great for um, for everyone. Um, so I have a couple questions for both of you on fundraising. Um, Gaston, tell me about your current plans for fundraising. Yeah, thank you, Pam, for the question. Uh, we we're expecting to close a Series A during the first part of the year after successfully closing a bridge round of fine funding, uh, I would say by the end of, of, of 2020. So we're really excited about the progress that we're making on this space. And yeah, we're growing quick. So really happy about it. Great. And Fatma, what are, your, what are, you, what are, you, what are you doing on the fundraising front? We just exceeded our goals for seed round. And uh, we're going to be closing um, everything by the end of this month. And next year, uh, we're targeting Series A funding. Excellent. Yeah, well, there's, as I said, there's um, talk to a lot of venture capitalists. And, um, and what's really critical is having that differentiated technology. And both of you have some very unique approaches and, and very good IP. That's excellent to see. I'm going to, to take some questions here from the audience. And I see a question for Fatma. And is there an opportunity for use in organic crop production? Would, would you have to extract the pheromone product from the nematodes or would synthetically, for, synthetically or fermentation product produce product be able to be labeled for organic use? Can you, can you wind our way th through the, through how you're gonna get organic certification or listing for, from the, the product and when it's produced? Because it is not synthetic and we have a very small number of steps that it is not classified as chemical, we actually try to minimize it to uh, two steps for the extraction. 
So it will be classified as organic. And we haven't uh, applied to OM OMRI, but we are uh, looking into how to apply and get organic certification. Okay, now, because moth pheromones are nature identical, they have been able to be um, uh, made in such a way that where they do get OMRI, but you're, you're saying you're actually gonna extract the natural yeah, okay, and you're not gonna make it synthetically, okay. Uh, one other thing, we're not extracting it from the nematodes. <laughs> oh, that's so, right, it's from the fermentation broth, right? <laughs> yes, it's the fermentation broth. <laughs> that's right, okay. And your, your um, let's talk a little bit about reg regulatory. Um, because your, your nemostim pheromone changes behavior but doesn't kill the pest directly, you actually are not regulated by the EPA, you're exempt. So you're fast to market, right? That's correct. Because we are targeting the predator's behavior for pest control. So it is not a pesticide and it's just an enhancer or additive to the uh, predator right. to uh, attack pests better. Now, Gaston, you have to go through, you are, are you EPA registered yet? Or you, you're in the process? We, we are uh, in the process. When do you expect, do you have any idea when, expect, are you on track with your PREA date? Yes, late 2022, uh, that's, uh, that's our best hope. Okay, great, great. Another question from the audience. I'm an aspiring entrepreneur and I'm very interested to hear from the guests and Dr. Marone about their path from startup to establishment. In particular, I'd like to know the following, whether they use the SBIR program, and if not, why not? Which federal agency's SBIR program was used? And what outside support and assistance did they receive to complete their SBIR? Well, I'll start with that one. I have over a million dollars at AgriQuest with SBIR USDA, phase one and phase two SBIR awards to help develop our products. And at Maroon Bio, more than, let's say 1.1 million with actually it was a National Science Foundation, not USDA, phase two STTR. So very successfully can use that non-dilutive funding. And Fama is a master of using non-dilutive funding to, uh, to enhance the goals of the company. So why don't you talk about your, your, that, 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 that you've done, Fatma? Uh, well, when you're a woman entrepreneur, you have to be really, really resourceful. You can't <laughs> just rely on even SBIRs. So um, we actually developed this strategy, how to get grant funding. Um, and we wanted to synergize it every time we got investment. And we couldn't really rely on one type of um, funding either, including grants. So we, um, we developed a strategy how to get into the market and then looked at the experiments and where could we actually apply, which one would appeal to SBIRs. So the experiments in the product development, the ones applied to SBIRs, we developed a project and we also established a CREDA, which was really critical for SBIR funding. We got funding SBIR phase one from USDA SBIR program. And we also got funding from NSF SBIR phase one. This is the most recent one. So we utilize those. Once you get SBIR phase one, actually government has other agencies that help you to prepare the phase two. So you're in better shape. But NSF also has uh, I-Corps program. I would highly recommend that. One of the reasons we were successful with NSF SBIR phase one, we had an actual data. Um, we actually talked to customers and we had 32, around 50 customer interviews. We directly talked about those experiences and relate those requirements with our um, technical uh, experiments. We said, we're going to do these experiments to address the uh, customer's need and uh, actually their problem. So that is what they were suggested and we were in a really good position. We also have basic research grants just because you're a startup doesn't mean that excludes you from basic research grant and always look at the eligibility. Do not uh, immediately disqualify yourself until you see eligibility that you have to find a way that how you're eligible as opposed to how you're not. <laughs> Always look at how can I make myself eligible for this program? Call the program director. Well, here's the case. How can we be eligible for this program? Be very positive. 
<laughs> Even if you get rejected, you get a second option, extremely positive. And for the SPIR phase one, always apply for a second one. Just because you rejected the first time, does it mean uh, you, you should lose hope? Uh, most of the experience, and when we talk to others, they said the second time they applied, they got the funding. Right. And let's see, uh, we had state programs we applied. We had applied to federal grants. Um, just talk to many people. Some of the grants shows up as a contracts. They, their name is grant, but it is more of a contract. It is for a just specific job. That was the ISS grant we got. It was a contract. And so apply to different type of it. And collaborations are really important. Great. Thank you. Gaston, did you have any um, economic development funds or government grants to get started? Um yes in Tilla, not here in in, in the us so okay. I'm, I'm highly considering to invite a cup of coffee to fatma and discuss more about about all those opportunities yeah i think you could get some usda or uh phase one and two grants i think so yeah 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 that's great to get that non-dilutive funding that really helps out um so uh, liana wants to ask a question So Pam, this harkens back to your mention of the recent survey that was published in Farm Journal. I wanted to ask our entrepreneurs and yourself about education or the, the growers who said, I need to know more. I mean, my understanding is um, the way products are just are marketed and distributed in our country is there's a very specific, there's very specific channels and very specific um, networks of firms that that are primarily in this space um, and and they employ crop advisors pesticide advisors that sort of thing what is the role of these firms vis-a-vis -vis the role of um, state and county extension to help educate and provide growers opportunities for trials and that sort of thing I can start. <laughs> First, you want to start that one, Fatma? Yeah, then we'll I'll go start. Yeah. The reason for that is when we have done customer interviews, thanks to Pam, actually, we were introduced to many of the uh, growers and um, some of the extension agents. We also had our own network uh, of the extension agents, but the grower interviews were really helpful. What they told us is they definitely use uh, pest control advisors. There are two types. One is the uh, employed by the pest control company and others are independent pest control advisor. They did trust independent pest control advisors because they said they're not paid by the um, uh, pesticide company, so they don't really have any allegiance to the um, pest control company, so they will be more trustworthy. They really trusted extension agents, the, uh, the university extension agents, because their funds are not dependent on anyone because they're independently paid. They trusted USDA uh, researchers and university extension agents because they believed their opinion were more, uh, un, uh, they were unbiased. And they just presented, they said they do uh, trust them even in the grower meetings. Pam and Gaston? Gaston, how would you like to do that, answer that? Um, I would say probably I'm a, a little bit biased with my background and experience in, in, in South America, because at some extent, MRLs, uh, play an important role on putting a lot of pressure on the shoulders of the growers. So just to let, let me give you a, a fresh example of what was going on until uh, back in January uh, this 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 summer. Uh, table table grape exporter suffered heavy rains for to what, 48 hours, and they were just about to harvest all the table grapes, uh, but there was no chemical product that could be sprayed in the field. By, by that time. So I would say biologicals and biopesticides play a key role to help farmers and growers to save as much as they could of their whole year production. So I've learned a little bit more on the current situation here in the, the US, probably there's less pressure to really deal with MRLs, but I think it's all a matter of time. 
Um, and for exporting countries, particularly, I think the rate of adoption of biologicals is, I think it's going, it's going to be tremendous. Great. I have one question for you, Gus, on another one, which I noticed, you know, you gave up uh, a TAM, uh, total addressable market of 12 million, but if I, in Chile, but if I look at the pie you showed, it was of all the biological products, right? Yes, that's only biopesticides. But your TAM is much bigger because your product works as well as chemicals, right? And also you can integrate your product into conventional and it doesn't have to, your comparison really shouldn't be the biological market, right? It should be much bigger, right? At some, at, at some extent, yes, but we're always looking to your direct competitors and, and, and yeah, it's, it's, a fair, it's a fair question or comment, but you're absolutely right. I mean, we're looking at the total available market for, for uh, crop protection in the end. Yeah, I'd hate to like let, see biological companies fighting with each other instead of making the pie bigger. But anyway, um, we have another question from the audience. Good one. And then Gus, I'll have you do this one first because you have to go in uh, four minutes. How do you allocate resources to the additional leads or opportunities in your development pipeline while having to focus and depend on your first product? Good question for both of you because you both have a pipeline. Gaston? Series A, now uh, <laughs> some grants um, and, and yeah, I think that's, that's it. Capital, okay. So if it, it, the more capital you have, the more you can focus on the pipeline, right? Yeah. Correct. Okay, Fatma? Same thing for me, it depends on the capital, uh, how it is coming. But in our case, it's also how fast we can get into market regulatory, which product is not regulated. And the, our second bottleneck is the um, manufacturing. So that's why we're focusing. What is the bottleneck? Which one can get into the market? So once we put all those things for a product, then we know how we can uh, move forward. And if we have the funding, definitely that has a priority. Great, thank you. Does anyone else in the audience or Liana have any more questions? Well, if not, uh, before we go, we do have the networking open. Um, so before we go, just wanna say thank you to our to AgStart and, um, and NC Biotech Center and all the other uh, sponsors of this. And Liana, I'll give you the last word after, after that, this as well. Um, we're really excited to have this growing bio ag cluster in, in Davis and the region and Woodland and not just, not just Davis, but the whole region. Um, we, we think we've got something special here next to the, the, one of the best ag universities and so close to all these growers. And so, and um, we're just very excited to, to have two very innovative entrepreneurs with us today. So Liana, I'll turn it back to you for final closing. Well, thank you so much, Pam. This has been a tremendous opportunity to learn more about ag biologicals. I hope that uh, all of you have learned something today and we will join you in the networking. Um, our, guests, uh, our guest entrepreneurs won't be able to join us, but I'll be there. I don't think Pam might be there. And thank you again for, for attending. We look forward to seeing you at the next forum. Thanks again. Thanks. Thank you for inviting. We really enjoyed. <laughs> thank you for the opportunity again.